So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to all of you. It is wonderful that we have so many people with us today in the Darbar Hall. Uh, unfortunately, there is a demonstration going on, but I think it will get over in a couple of minutes because government employees never work beyond 5.30 in the evening. <laughs> and I mean, that's the hope I have. All right. Um, let me start by saying that it is indeed a unique honor and a privilege for us, for the Asiatic Society of Mumbai, to have such eminent theater artists sharing the same stage. In addition to the formal part of our program, I hope they will also share some stories of other occasions when they were on the stage together for Shakespeare and beyond. Coming to this evening, we are now at the, at the culmination of 400 years of Shakespeare. So yet again, it's a special occasion. The selection of readings from Shakespeare is the grand finale of our year-long observance of the Bard's quadricentenary and gazes ahead to his ever fresh relevance. Uh, kindly allow me to present our actors and the theater groups they belong to. I know they do not need an introduction, but protocol demands that I say a few words about each one of them uh, individually and about the theater groups. So um, let me start with the theater group Bombay, which has long catalyzed theater and arts activity in the city. It was the crown jewel of Mumbai's theater landscape. Founded in 1946 by Bobby Sultan Padamsi, it offered the best in contemporary European theater to the city and to India. Soon it was working in the Indian languages too and producing Girish Karnad, Pratap Sharma, and Vijay Tendulkar. Today it runs the Sultan Padamsi Playwriting Award. Shakespeare has occupied a prime place in the group's offerings from Othello in 1946 to Macbeth in 2015. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little about ACE Productions. ACE is the acronym for the Academy for Creative Expression, and it is spearheaded by the, its managing director, Rael Padamsi who is a vibrant, versatile, dynamic theater personality. It is well reputed for the production, design, and execution of mega theatrical events, both national and international. Her company, Ace Productions, has been at the forefront of this domain for over 20 years. Amongst her most successful endeavors, I'd just like to mention a couple of them. There is the Academy for Creative Expression, which runs the speech and theater courses for children. And another one I'd like to mention is the ACE Talent Academy, showcasing and providing a platform for India's talent. To come to uh, the individual actors, uh, unfortunately, um, we do not have Vijay Krishna with us today. He has a leg injury, but we still have three of Mumbai's theatre legends with us. So let me start with Padmashri Alec Padamsi. He is one of India's leading theatre directors, having directed six plays of Shakespeare and held dozens of Shakespeare workshops. He is a multifaceted genius who wears several hats, one of them as the brand father of, in, of modern Indian advertising, and the next, I don't know which comes first and which comes second, so I'll just say the next, is as the guru of English theater in India, with over 70 major productions to his name. Then we have Jerson de Cunha, who too needs no introduction. He is a stage and film actor, 
social worker and author. Jerson has spent a lifetime in advertising, marketing, and in the theater group Bombay. He's a superstar of the mini cameo in filmdom, most recently in the film Rangoon. He's a trustee and convener of Agni, a citizen movement for better governance in Mumbai. Sabira Merchant is a versatile personality with many admirable qualities. She is responsible for training Femina Miss Indias for the local as well as international competitions. She was always interested in the dramatic arts and the stage, and her first major breakthrough was theater groups The Word by Pratap Sharma, which was followed by many more. She bagged the All India Critics Award for her role of Blanche Dubois in Tennessee Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire. She is most popularly known as the hostess for the quiz program, What's the Good Word, which was televised in the early 1970s on Doordarshan for a record-breaking 15 years. And just when she has also acted in Hindi films, including Trikal for Sham Benegal. Uh, I now request the actors to kindly take their positions uh, in front of the table. And I know you're all impatient to hear them. So um, it only remains for me to say, on with the show. Friends, the wonder of Shakespeare is that though he died 450 years ago, he is as alive today as any living playwright in the world. His performances are on a daily basis in every country in the world. Whether they're speaking in Spanish or speaking in Urdu or speaking in, I don't know, uh, Swahili. He is such a popular because the themes and the characters are incredibly contemporary. That's why his plays are performed every day. It is a pity that Shakespeare is taught in our schools as literature. Wrong. He is a playwright. He should be taught as drama. It is only when the words of Shakespeare are heard that you realize the wonder and the magic of his incredible vocabulary. And in order to understand better the Shakespeare today, one of the reasons we're doing this evening is to tell people that no, he's not a foreign language, he is the English language. And if you listen to it carefully, even the words that you don't quite understand, because the context of the words come out so clear that the meaning comes through. That is what it is. In addition, his words have emotion. And when they are spoken, they come out much more strongly than when they are read silently on the printed page. He is not a printed page person, really. He's a theater person. He was in the theater, the Globe Theater. He wrote plays for them. He even acted on the stage. And that is the genius of Shakespeare. So he exists where? In the space between the actor's lips and the audience's ear. That is where Shakespeare really is. So therefore, we have today a reading of some of the most exciting passages from Shakespeare. In this presentation, our actors hope to put you in touch with not only the meaning, but the emotion and the power of his magical words.
To set the Shakespeare scene, we start with the chorus from Henry V, read by Gerson de Cunha. <laughs> that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirit that had dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Let us, ciphers to this great account, on your imaginary forces work. Piece out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think, when we talk of horses, that you see them. For it is your thoughts that now must deck our kings, carry them here and there, jumping our time, typing the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit me chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. <laughs> The next piece is a scene from The Taming of the Shrew. One of my favorites. The first Shakespeare I ever did uh, was The Taming of the Shrew. And as a matter of fact, I have the same actor who acted in 1954, Gerson de Cunha, playing this role today. <laughs> Amazing, yeah? 1954. Now, the shrew, the scene that we're doing is a very, very witty clash of personalities. Uh, between the braggart Petruchio, who tries to win the hand of Katharina, played by Sabira Merchant, the shrew. Shakespeare was this long before that term was even invented. And here we go. The actors are on stage. <laughs> I'll attend her here and woo her with some spirit when she comes. Say that she rail. Why then I'll tell her plain, she sings as sweetly as a nightingale. Say that she frown. I'll say she looks as clear as morning roses, newly washed with dew. If she deny to wed, I crave the day when I shall ask the bands, and when be married. But here she comes, and now Petruchio, speak. Good morrow, Kate, for that's your name I hear. Well have you heard, but something hard of hearing. <laughs> they call me Catherine, that you talk of me. You lie in fate, for you are called plain Kate, and bonny Kate, and sometimes Kate the cursed, but Kate the prettiest Kate in Christendom. Kate of Kate Hall, my super dainty Kate, for dainties are all Kate, and therefore Kate, take this of me, Kate of my consolation. Hearing thy mildness praised in every town, thy virtue spoke of and thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs, myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. Moved, moved in good time. Let him that moved you hither remove you hence. <laughs> I knew you at the first. You were a movable. Why, what's a movable? <laughs> a joint stool. Thou hast hit it. Come, sit on me. Ah, asses are made to bear, and so are you. Women are made to bear, and so are you. No, no such jade as you, if me you mean. Alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee, for knowing thee to be but young and light. Too light for such a swain as you to catch, and yet 
as heavy as my weight should be. Come, come, you wasp fit. What to aim? The very waspish. Best beware my sting. My remedy is then to pluck it out. Aye, if the fool could find out where it lies. Oh, who knows not where a wasp does wear his sting? In his tail. In his tongue. Whose tongue? Yours, if you talk of tails. <laughs> and so farewell. What, with my tongue in your tail? Nay, come, Kate, come, good Kate, I am a gentleman. That I'll try. He strikes her. I swear I'll cuff you if you strike again. If you strike me, you are no gentleman. Nay, come, Kate, come. You must not look so sour. It is my fashion when I see a crab. Why, here's no crab, and therefore look not sour. There is, there is. Then show it me. Had I a glass, I would. What? You mean my face? <laughs> well aimed of such a young one. Now, by St. George, I am too young for you. Yet you are withered. Tis with care. I care not. Nay, hear you, Kate. In sooth, you scape not so. I shape you. If I tarry, let me go. No, not a whit. I find you passing gentle. Just told me you were rough and coy and sullen. And now I find reporter very liar. For thou art pleasant, gamesome, passing courteous, but slow in speech, yet sweet as springtime flowers. Why does the world report that Kate doth halt? Oh, let me see thee walk. Thou dost not limp. Where did you study all this goodly speech? It is extempore from my mother wit. <laughs> a witty mother, a witty mother, witless else her son. Am I not wise? Yes, keep you warm. Marry, so I mean, sweet Catherine, in thy bed, and therefore setting all this chat aside, thus in plain terms. Your father had consented that you shall be my wife. Your dowry agreed on, and will you, nil you, I will marry you. For I am he and born to tame you, Kate, and bring you from a wild Kate to a Kate conformable as other household Kates. <laughs> Now comes a speech by the conniving Cassius from Julius Caesar, in which the speech itself speaks for itself. For once, upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber River, chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Darest thou Cassius now, leap into this angry flood and swim to yonder point upon the word. Accoutred as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow. So indeed he did. The torrent roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive the point proposed, Caesar cried, Help me, Cassius, or I sink. I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy the old Anchises bear, so from the waves of Tiber did I a tired Caesar. And this man has now become a god, and Cassius is a wretched creature and must bend his body if Caesar carelessly but nod on him. <laughs> Now we come to one of Shakespeare's most famous characters, Lady Macbeth. Lady Macbeth is the most powerful woman uh, creation of Shakespeare's. In this scene, she is waiting the arrival of King Duncan of Scotland, who is planning, she is planning with her husband to kill King Duncan, so that he, Macbeth, will then be crowned king. The roles are played by Sabira Merchant as Lady Macbeth and myself as Macbeth. The 
raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of King Duncan under my battlements. Come, ye spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here. Fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it, and it. Come, come, come to my woman's breast and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you feed on nature's mischief. Come, come, come thick night and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell that my keen knife sees not the wound it makes. No heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry ho, ho! Enter Macbeth. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight, and when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never, never shall sun that morrow see. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Macbeth is now convinced by Lady Macbeth that he must assassinate the king, King Duncan. But he is haunted. He's haunted by a strange apparition. He hears strange noises. And then... The apparition. Is this a dagger that I see before me? The handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat-oppressed brain? I see thee yet in form as real as this which now I draw. Thou marshalest me the way I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. And on thy blade, gouts of blood? There is no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs me thus to mine eyes. Thou sure and firm-set earth, hear not my steps, which way they walk, for fear the very stones tell of my whereabouts. Huh. While I threaten, he lives. Words to the heart of deeds too cold breath gives. I go. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. <laughs> Othello, as you know, Othello was the black general in Venice who married the fair and lovely Desdemona. Othello's lieutenant, Iago, is determined to poison Othello, mind and heart, by seeding the suspicion that Desdemona is being unfaithful to him with his second in command, the handsome Cassio. Justin de Cunha plays Othello, and I play Iago in this scene. <laughs> An 
not poppy, no mandragora, nor all the drought of the world shall ever medicine thee to that sweet sleep which thou owedst yesterday. Ah, uh, ah, uh, false to me. Why, how now, General? No more of that. Avaunt, be gone. Thou hast set me on the rack. I swear it is better to be much abused than but to note a little. How now, my lord? What sense said I of her stolen hours of lust? I saw it not, thought it not, it harmed not me. I slept the next night well, was free and merry. I found not Cassio's kisses on her lips. He that is robbed, not wanting what is stolen, let him not know it. And he's not robbed at all. I am sorry to hear this. I have been happy if the general camp, pioneers and all, had tasted her sweet body, so I had nothing known. Oh, now forever, farewell the tranquil mind. Farewell content. Farewell the plumed troop and the big wars that make ambition virtue. Oh, farewell. Farewell the neighing steed and the shrill trump, the spirit-stirring drum, the ear-piercing fife, the royal banner, and all quality, pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious war. Farewell. The fellow's occupation's gone. Is it possible, my lord? Villain, be sure thou prove, my lover whore. Be sure, be sure of it. Give me the ocular proof. Make me to see it. Or at the least so prove it. My noble if lord. If thou slander her and torture me, never pray more. Abandon old remorse. On horror's head horrors accumulate. Do deeds to make heavens weep. All earth amazed. For nothing canst thou to damnation add greater than that. Oh, grace, oh, heaven, forgive me. Are you a man? Have you a soul or sense? God be with you. Take mine office. Oh, wretched, wretched fool, that livest to make thine honesty a vice. O oh, monstrous world, take note, take note, O oh world. To be direct and honest is not safe. From hence, I love no friend, since love breeds such offense. By the world, I think my wife be honest, and think she is not. I think that thou art just, and think thou art not. Her name that was as fresh as Diane's visage is now big rhymed and black as mine own face. Would I were satisfied? I see, sir, you are eaten up with passion. I do repent me that I put it to you. You would be satisfied? Would. Nay, I will. And nay, but how? How satisfied, my lord? Would you, the supervisor, grossly gape on, behold her topped? Death and damnation. Oh! It were a tedious difficulty, I think, to bring them to that prospect. Damn them, then! What then? How then? What shall I say? Where is satisfaction? It is impossible you should see this. Were they as prime as goats, as hot as monkeys, as salt as wolves in pride, and fools as gross as ignorance made drunk? But yet, I say, if imputation and strong circumstance which lead directly to the door of truth will give you satisfaction, you may have it. Give me a living reason, she's disloyal. Mm, I do not like this office. But since I am entered into it thus so far, pricked to it by foolish honesty and, and love, I will go on. I lay with Cassio lately, and being troubled with a raging tooth, I could not sleep. There are a kind of men so loose of soul that in their sleep will mutter their affairs. One of this kind is Cassio. In sleep, I heard him say, Sweet Desdemona, let us be wary, let us hide our loves. And then, sir, would he grip and wring my hand, O oh, sweet creature, and then kiss me hard, as if he plucked up kisses that grew by their roots on my very lips, then laid his leg over my thigh and sighed and kissed, and then cried, Cursed fate that gave thee to the moor. Oh, monstrous, monstrous. Nay, this was but his dream. But this denoted a foregone conclusion. 
to shoot doubt though it be but a dream and this may help to thicken other proofs that demonstrate thinly i'll tear her all to pieces nay but be wise yet we see nothing done she may be honest yet uh, tell me this have you not sometimes seen a handkerchief spotted with strawberries in your wife's hand i gave her such a one it was my first gift i know not that but such a handkerchief i'm sure it was your wife's did i today see cassio wipe his beard with if it be that if it be that or any that was hers it speaks against her with the other proofs oh that the slave had 40000 lives one is too poor too weak for my revenge now do i see this this true locariago or my fond love thus do i blow to heaven tis gone arise black vengeance from my hollow cell yield up o love thy crown and heart it thrown to tyrannous hate swell bosom with thy fraught for tis of aspic's tongue yet be content o oh, blood 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 patience i say your mind perhaps may change never iago like to the pontic sea whose icy current and compulsive course ne'er feels retiring ebb but keeps due on to the propontic and the hellespont even so my bloody thoughts with violent pace shall ne'er look back ne'er ebb to humble love till that a capable and wide revenge swallow them up now by yon marble heaven in new reverence of a sacred vow i here engage my words do not rise yet witness you ever burning lights above you elements that trip us round about witness that here iago doth give the execution of his wit hands and heart to wrong do thelo's service let him command and to obey shall in me no remorse what bloody business ever i greet thy love not with vain thanks but with acceptance bounteous and will upon the instant put thee to it within these 3 days let me hear thee say that cassius not alive my friend is dead it is done at your request but but let her live stand lewd minx o oh, dam ha cap go with me but now at thou my lieutenant i am your own forever Here is a soliloquy. A soliloquy was an amazing invention by Shakespeare. He was able to let us hear the thoughts of his main actors. They just spoke to the audience. They shared what turmoil they were going through. It was not to another character in the play. It was to the audience. He's the first playwright who actually involved the audience. It's a wonderful thing. The soliloquy. This soliloquy is. by macbeth on hearing of his wife's suicide shakespeare speaks of existentialism listen carefully listen carefully 450 years before jean paul sartre coined the term in 1946 <laughs> tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day till the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death out out brief candle life's but a walking shadow 
a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. The next speech is Hamlet instructing the actors on how to perform a play. The play that Hamlet has written in order to trap his uncle, the king, into a confession that he murdered Hamlet's father. What is interesting about this is it's a play within a play and has a very, very powerful influence on the players themselves who are acting the part and on the audience. Again here, audience involvement is very, very high. Hamlet, in this case, in a brilliant exposition of how a director tells his actors to act and not to ham it up. Played by Jason de Kuna. <clears throat> Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I had us leave the town crier spoke my lines. No, do not saw the air too much with your hand thus. But you was all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest stand, as I may say, whirlwind of passion, you must acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul to hear a robustious, periwig pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who for the most part are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. I would have such a fellow whipped. Pray you avoid it. Be not too tame, neither, but let your discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance that you overstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is for the purpose of playing, whose end, for that the first was and is to hold, as to a, the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time is form and pressure. Now, this overdone or come tardy off, don't make the unskillful laugh, cannot but make the judicious grieve, the censure of which one must in your allowance overweigh a whole theatre of others. Oh, there be players that I've seen play and others praise, and that highly not to speak of profanely, that neither having the accent of Christians nor the gait of Christian, pagan, or man have so strutted and bellowed that I have thought some of nature's journeymen had made men and not made them well. They imitated humanity so abominably. And let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them, for there be of them that will themselves laugh to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh Two, though in the meantime, some necessary question of the play be then to be considered. That's villainous and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. Go, make it ready. The last piece is Shylock, a much misunderstood. He is not the merchant of Venice, it's Antonio who borrows the money from him and then can't repay. And then, in jest, he thought that Shylock said, well, then I will have a pound of flesh. And he thought it was a jest, but Shylock is determined to get that pound of flesh from the Christian. Now, he's a Jew. Living in Venice at that time, to be a Jew was to be a Dalit in India. 
discrimination against minorities is a theme that goes way, way, way back, 450 years or more, more. And this is a scene in which, at last, Shylock has the upper hand. Though he's a Jew, and he's only a miserable moneylender, he now has the great Antonio at his mercy. Senor Antonio, many a time, and often in the Rialto, you have berated me about my monies and my usances. Still, have I borne it with a patient shrug. For sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spit upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for use of that which is mine own. And now you come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so? You that did spit your room upon my beard and foot me as a stranger cur over your threshold? Monies is your suit. What shall I say to you? Shall I not say, hath a dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend 3,000 ducats? Or, or shall I bend low and, 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 and in a servant's voice with whispering humbleness say this? Eh, hey, sir, you spit on me on Wednesday last. Another time you call me dog. And for these courtesies, I will lend you thus much monies. <laughs> wonderful audience, and I'd like to say, since we have a bit of time, and we, we race through Shakespeare pretty fast, <laughs> uh, I'd like to say that we should like to share our, uh, our ideas about Shakespeare, and we would like to hear your questions. So can we have a, what's called a Q&A, &A, a question and answer, on the, 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 the pieces we've done today, or on anything to do with Shakespeare? We'd be most happy, Justin, Sabira, and myself would be most happy to share with you our experience of Shakespeare. Please, let's start. Dolly, why don't you start? <laughs> I'm still amazed that the three of you can remember those lines so beautifully and how you relate it to emotions which I think each one of us goes through every day. Um, your Shylock, Alec, uh, which we've heard over and over again, but each time there's a freshness to it. And I think everyone here can relate to it and see that there is something yeah. different. The question is? Oh, my question. I have no question. I have no question. It's just... Um, Let me give you an insight. Well, I w okay, my question would be, okay. in today's <laughs> India with the kind of things that are going on, um, where does this literature stand? How are we going to take it forward? Good question. Can you just want to answer? Yeah. Uh, because we are faced with misgovernance, we are faced with unfairness, we are faced with violence, we are faced with an unequal treatment of human beings, I think the only way to stand up to it is as Shakespeare did, to take note of it and take a stand upon it. But not just with words, I think with action too. I think spitting, as Alec did a moment ago, is an action <laughs> that we must adopt. Who else? Come on. What other action would you say does it? Apart from his very physical act of spitting, what action would you take? Because you're a great political activist. How would you take this forward? Well, the mis 
governance to which we are being subjected must be fought with the right governance. Mm -hmm. In other words, seek build a democracy, yes. or rather bad democracy, or democracy against which we can hold many things, but still a democracy. Which means if we get together and make our point, then not only will we be, will we be doing something, but we will win. I have many an instance, and we can talk about that later if you like, where by getting together and making a point, sometimes going to court, we have won. So the action would be to make democracy work by coming together to make it a democracy. So the point is we have to come together. That's it. I mean, we've got to come together about the same thing. About the same thing. <laughs> yes. And not about yeah. seven different things, which is a way that we have of living. Anyone else? Anything about Shakespeare that you yes. find remarkable or unremarkable? Uh, this question is to Alec. Please. Hello. Yeah? We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, Alec, are you working with any regional theatre groups or Shakespeare's kept alive in all our regional Indian languages? What is happening with Shakespeare in those Sorry, regional languages? I repeated it one line. I, I'm not, uh, I, didn't I said, are you working yes. with regional theatre groups so Shakespeare is kept alive in all regional languages of India? Any yeah. initiative? Yeah, yeah. No, no. I must honestly say I'm not uh, because I think Shakespeare, the strangest thing about Shakespeare, and a lot of people will contradict me, is that the words of Shakespeare, you know, are so powerful in the English language. He invented 50% of the English language before World War II. Do you know that? He and the Bible, King James Version of the Bible, 50% of the language used was actually created by these two. But once you move it into a, a different language, whether it's Spanish or whether it's Greek or whether it's uh, Urdu or whether it's uh, Malayalam or whatever, some of the power is lost because those words, you, there are no great, such great uh, authors, such great wordsmiths in the language that can take his essence and recreate the sound. It's not, when I say tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, have you noticed, why does he repeat it? He's a great believer in alliteration for power. Ta, tomorrow, ta, tomorrow, ta, tomorrow creeps in this petty pace. Alliteration is when you use the same letter to begin the word with. Petty pace. Creeps in this petty pace till the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to d d dusty death. It's amazing. You don't notice it, but when you study Shakespeare, as I've done, you realize the man was a genius, not only by creating these fantastic characters, whether it's Shylock or Othello or whatever, but also he was a genius with being able to use words. And remember, he wrote almost all his plays in iambic pentameter, pentameter, which is 10 beats to the line. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and 10. So actually, you could set Shakespeare to music. And I had the temerity the, 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 you might say, braggadocio, Joseph, to set friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears, Mark Antony's speech in Julius Caesar. I worked with a rock musician called Joe Alvarez, and the both of us turned out the entire speech in rock. And we played it at a, a Bombay, uh, one of the uh, Kalagora festivals about uh, three years ago. And the young audience just went crazy. But a lot of people came to me after it and said, Alec, you have destroyed Shakespeare. You cannot set it to music. You can. As long as you use his words, you can. And that was a real lesson for me as well, that Shakespeare is such a marvelous playwright that he can be set to music. And today, as you know, abroad, and quite a lot over here now, musicals have become the rage, you know? We have musicals about everything and anything. And this is what, what you discover about Shakespeare, that he is extremely, how shall I say, flexible. He, he, he lends himself to all sorts of interpretations and all sorts of styles. You will set Shakespeare, you know, in, 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 in Denmark, where after all Hamlet was written about Denmark. And uh, they've done it there. They did it actually in Elsinore Castle in Denmark many, many years ago. So he is 
That's why he's still alive, because he's relevant to all the things, as Justin was saying, to the political sphere, to any sphere that you like. He is very, very relevant. And I would suggest that those who have children who are still in school insist that the school put on a Shakespeare play or scenes from Shakespeare every year. Because then, if you're in the English language, your diction also becomes clearer. Did you, did any of you, I'd like, I'd like to ask a question. Did any of you feel that we couldn't understand Shakespeare hey, this evening? Anyone? No. Candy, you're a teacher. Did you feel that? Uh, yeah? I would, uh, we have Shakespeare. Yeah, take the mic, take the mic. Give the mic. Sir, to answer your question. Okay, well, we'll come to you, Candy, in a minute. Yes, please. To answer your question, sir, I didn't understand Shakespeare. Yes. All these characters, yes. by virtue of my Navy background and going yes. out to the seas yes. to make a career elsewhere, yes. all these names, the Macbeth, the Othello, Shylock, yes. they all take me back to my school days. Yes. And thereafter, the interaction ended. And I would like to ask you, sir, yes. which book will introduce me to Shakespeare at my age of 74, which will, which will help me understand your presentations better this evening? Yeah. But did you understand, first, let, I will answer your question, but first I'd like to ask you, did you follow what Shylock was saying? He may have used some strange words like Rialto, which you didn't know, which is the village square in Venice, but did you understand through his emotion and the, his character what he was getting at? That's what I want to say. By virtue of the story that I know of yes. Shylock. That's, I understand no, that. By virtue of the story I know of Macbeth. Yes, yes, yes. So, by virtue of, as I said, no, all besides these... Besides the story, did you feel that it was easier to understand Shakespeare when it is spoken by an actor rather than when it is read by the teacher in a monotonous tone? Of also, course. Uh, tomorrow and tomorrow, fixed in a steady pace. That's sir, what I'm asking. Sir, we have to, we have to live with the fact yes. that in the 21st century, yes. the language of Shakespeare yes. is not something that we encounter every day. No, quite right. So, yes. therefore, we have to get under the cover of Shakespeare. Yes. Well, that is what I mean. Did you feel that this evening you understood Shakespeare better than you had before when you were in school? I'll put it this way, that it has generated more interest in me, so that it will take me back to Shakespeare. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, yeah, I'm, yes. in other words, sir, your visit has uh, has sown the seeds again yes. for me to go to Shakespeare again. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> what more can you say? Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Candy. Please, Candy, you want to, if you pass the mic here, please. Oh, she's got a mic. Oh, I can't see the light is so bright in here. Uh, 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 Risha, dim the actor's lights for a bit, blinding us. as well as this gentleman did. Yes. But we did study uh, Shakespeare in high school and also college. And I think that uh, it would be great if a group like this or any other that did Shakespearean stuff um, would consult with the school system, you know, to uh, if they are teaching certain plays yes. or using them in the curriculum, yes. that they would, um, you know, have people like yourself come and act in out, them. Yes, for and them. the students also to do yes. that. We we have done that in the past. When I did Macbeth a few years ago, uh, we went to several schools, English speaking schools, of course, and did scenes from Macbeth for them and explained why Macbeth was such a powerful play. And yes, that sort of thing should be done. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, yeah, yes, for the cathedral and many, many other places. So we have done that, but I will agree with you, it has fallen by the wayside because we were too busy doing something else and this and that. But thank you for your prompting. We shall restart. Yes, indeed. That would be great, thanks. What about anyone here? Please. At the rear, is there anybody Oh, no, no, here, here, here's the lady in front. Lady in front. All right, we'll come to that later. Uh, 
I just wanted to say I'm I'm Mrs. Wadia, Ratti Dadi Wadia, and I've been teaching Shakespeare for the last 50 years, and I'm a great fan of Shakespeare, and uh, I have an entire <coughs> exhibition of artifacts of Shakespeare which I put up in different schools, etc. But the love and the um, passion was created when I was studying in Queen Mary School, and the Shakespeareana company used to come and they used to enact. Macbeth and uh, Merchant of Venice and so many other extracts which was really fantastic for us and uh, also we had wonderful teachers in Queen Mary School as well as in Wilson College. Uh, Shirin Kuchetka was our Shakespeare professor and Professor Choksi's uh, daughter. So that when you said that uh, um, it should not be taught, I disagree. No, no, no. I didn't say it should not be taught. I said it should not be taught as literature on a printed page, it should be taught as theatre on a living stage. Yes, but uh, when, it is, when it is to be taught initially, it has to be literature. Along with that, we can do, we do enact, uh, enactments with the children and uh, act out. But we definitely have to study it as literature also, because otherwise the depth of the characters and the language we cannot uh, explain to the children. You also said that uh, actors can act out uh, before the... But I challenge you, sir, teachers also can. <laughs> <laughs> please, in, please invite me to your next performance. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like us? Yeah. Yeah, all of us. I mean all of us, yes. I think Come I would uh, appreciate yes, yes, uh, yes. Rati speaking give, give, on give behalf of the mic, give teachers. The mic, please. I it's okay, my the voice here. is loud enough. Um, I, I thank Rati for speaking on behalf of yeah. teachers yeah. because I think uh, teachers and I speak as a teacher and there are several here I know. And I think we also try our best to bring Shakespeare alive in the class. Oh. Unfortunately, we may not be able to match the actors. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very kind of you. And yes, that's quite true. There are teachers. It's not that there are no teachers. But basically, Shakespeare, when I was in school, when Johnson was in school, when Sabira was in school, and many, 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 many people were in school, Shakespeare was only taught uh, what is the motive behind Iago's hate for uh, mm -hmm. Othello. Not the words. The words are there to be spoken, not only to be read by the eye, but heard by the ear. That's all I'm saying. I'm making that point. I'm you're not making, saying that's the only point. point. That's not you're the making only the point. point that Shakespeare should be well taught, not badly taught. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. I didn't say that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, even I am a teacher and I admire teachers. Oh, Microphone, my dear. Mike, please. I am a teacher and I admire teachers and what they did for us in school. But one thing I can say, my teacher taught us the Merchant of Venice wonderfully. But for the first time, I have sympathy for Shylock after I have seen an actor. Do I want to go back yeah, to my Merchant of Venice and do If I may just complete that, can you hear me? Yeah. You know, uh, it is amazing because I played the role of Shylock in school. Oh, okay. <laughs> And when I was 16 in Queen Mary School, and we had this wonderful teacher who I'm sure you all know, Mary Setha. Of course. Yes. She is a Shakespearean actress. That's and right. Acted That's with right. my brother, Bobby Palancy, and yes. Lady Macbeth. That's right. And she was our elocution teacher, and we did Shakespearean plays with her every single year. And so I think we were quite privileged. And of course, we had uh, Jennifer Kapoor coming uh, with uh, her troupe yeah, once yeah. a year. And yeah. so Jeffrey Kendall Jeff and his Shakespeare right. Honours. Jennifer Kendall. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful troupe. Um, as a visitor from the, the land of Shakespeare, can I thank you uh, for such an amazing rendition this evening? I have a specific question, Sabina. Uh, Taming the Shrew. Most ways you read it is a very sexist play. How how do you think it's possible to turn it round, given using the words in the script that you have to stick to? You mean turn it around. Turn it around to become uh, supportive of women, of women. A more feminist. A feminist approach rather than a sexist approach. Well, I have to think about that. <laughs> No, I think it is there. It is in the script. He, he, the 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 script. Let's, let's, let's give her a chance. Yeah. <laughs> I have to think about it. Well, I have to think about that because the way I've seen the shrew is shrewish. Mm. Uh, 
as, as it is, and the mm. works are written by Shakespeare for that. Mm. So for me to rethink your point of view, mm. I'd have to delve into the script, study it again, and see mm. how else would a rendition work, and how would it work? How would I best make the words appear not as they appear written, but in a more muted manner, mm -hmm. as you're saying, more feminine, not so mm. feminine? No, Shakespeare has so many interpretations. Laurence Olivier, the greatest Shakespearean actor of all time, did play Iago opposite a very famous actor uh, uh, who played Othello. And he, that is Olivier and the director, decided that they would uh, do an interpretation without telling Othello, the person who played Othello, uh, would give a, a, an interpretation. And at that time, it was very... Uh, a daring to have anyone who was gay. So they decided Iago actually was not a motiveless malignity, but actually he was in love with Othello. <laughs> so they, Olivier played Iago gay. Not obviously, but in subtle parts, suddenly, you'd get a feeling that, hey, he's a little too close to Shakespeare. He's a little too this and a little too that. So interpretations, and I would say, Savira, if you read the last uh, uh, paragraph, the last speech of uh, Katrina, where she humbly says that we should be the servants of men and this and that and the other. And when I read it the other day, I realized that it's a very sarcastic speech. She's actually making fun of the whole idea that we should be the servants of men. So it all depends on the interpretation. Interpretation, yeah. of course, yes. Uh, but I disagree. I think that Taming of the Shrew could never be a, a feminist document. No. Why do you disagree? You'd, you'd have you'd have really to traduce the meaning of the play yeah. as written by yeah, Shakespeare. That's what I said. Shakespeare lends himself to uh, tra 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 traduction, if there's any such word. <laughs> uh, no, he does everything. It's so so amazing, you know. Hamlet is slightly crazy. I've seen productions of that, and the most amazing production I saw was Othello, and Othello was played by a woman and Desdemona was played by a man in London. And you have done Julius Caesar with Julius Caesar as a woman. by a woman. That's right. And I'm going to do it again. <laughs> because I feel women uh, deserve now to be seen as power figures and not just as handmaidens of the male chauvinist pig. Good evening. It's not a question per se, but perhaps a statement. Uh, you were talking, I'd like to talk about one, uh, while all teachers, as she said, would not be in your caliber, all three of you. Uh, it's a teacher's duty also to bring passion to the classroom since Shakespeare is part of the syllabus and uh, we can't do anything about that. So we have to bring passion to the little group we are teaching and become little actors, however good or bad, but we will become good as we go along. And that passion has to be felt, and we have to be passionate so that we can convey it to the yes, students. Well said. And number two, as you said about interpretation, in The Merchant of Venice also, we have Antonio, you know, not very happy at the beginning of the play, and he's in a pensive mood. Perhaps some, some people have kindly or unkindly suggested that he was in love with Bassanio and couldn't bear Bassanio yeah. to go away. <laughs> and uh, that was why. So Shakespeare does lend himself to a lot of interpretations. It only means we're just reading the play closer and closer and getting closely involved with the characters. So that's why he'll always live long after we are dead and gone. Well said, well said. So uh, I have a question. Uh, it could be Am I being heard? Hold the mic close for the Yeah. Uh, is it better? Risha, can you increase the volume of the mic, please, oh, the audience it, mic? Switch it on. It's on. No, it's on. It's on. Yeah. Um, the question, uh, I mean, any, uh, uh, any of you could answer it. Uh, Shakespeare is all about, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Shakespeare is all about uh, words, and as you rightly said, spoken word. But there is this wonderful interpretation of Shakespeare by Kurosawa, uh, Throne of Blood where he completely uh, went away from the words. How did he manage to do it? I'm, I'm curious to know your, your views on that. A very good point. Hmm, very? A very good point, I thought. No, it was a change in the whole interpretation of what 
uh, Macbeth was. Not me. Yeah, it was Macbeth. Throne of Blood. Yeah, Macbeth. Throne yes. of Blood, Macbeth. 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 He interpreted as a, a, sama, a samurai warrior, a king, who he had some reference in, in, in Japanese history, and he decided that is what he'd like to do. But he used the storyline of Shakespeare, but he did not use the words at or all. the thoughts. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. And it was a brilliant film, yeah. one of the most brilliant films I've ever seen, but it was not Shakespeare. I mean, in the true sense of the word. Yeah, but they are interpretations. Why not? Why not? He's a marvelous, marvelous man. I'd just like to say, before we close, and I know time is getting on, and I know that uh, according to the rules and regulations of the, this uh, society, that they have oh. oh, I thought there was a storm brewing because I was standing up. I said, Shakespeare strikes again. Now, I'd just like to say, on behalf of the theater group huh, and uh, Ace Productions, who put on this little show today, uh, that we are prepared to put it on for groups of people, maybe the Rotary or, or the Lions or any group or schools or colleges, anywhere. We would love to carry, shall we say, the flag or the banner, I should say, of Shakespeare across Bombay at first and maybe, if we get some lovely sponsors, take it across India, just as Jeffrey Kendall did many, many years ago. So marvelous thing, huh? So please, if anyone has any ideas on that, please get in touch with us. Hmm? Uh, you can use my uh, email, it's very easy. It's alec, A-L-Y-Q-U-E, P-A-D, for the first three letters of my surname, alecpad at gmail.com. That's it, yeah? Thank you so much for being a very, very involved audience. And that's what we love about audiences. You get involved, right, Just Um, just a uh, yes. um, moment. Um, she's right here. There she's sitting there. First row there. Yeah. there. <coughs> the little lady there. Good. Yeah. Um, if I can have. Uh, I, I want. I want all the script back. The last one. No. <laughs> um, Alec. Alec, yes. um, if I can have a moment's attention, please. Please, please. Yes, yeah. no, I was just saying. Yeah, please. Yeah. Announce it. Um, yes, please. Yeah. Just a minute, folks. This is um, always um, done at the end of our Asiatic uh, Society's talks and performances. And um, I have to. I have to admit that after hearing the words spoken here, any words that I speak would be very poor follow-up. But um, Jerson began uh, with the chorus when he ended asking us to kindly judge the play. And I think today that was not even needed because we were all in the right mood and we've been amply rewarded. Thank you, Alec, for reminding us that the words have to come from the lips of the actor and reach the ears of the audience. And every single word we heard spoken today did that. It flew across to all of us from your lips, Jerson's, and Sabira's. Um, Sabira, I thought <clears throat> you were delightful as Kate. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And it's such a witty exchange. And, and it's like a battle of wits. And I think each one was trying to get the, be the better of the other. I think the woman won, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so a round of applause for Kate. And of course, um, Lady Macbeth, I, I think every actor would want to do that role. And, and uh, when she wants all the venom in her blood rather than uh, any drop of um, uh, pity or mercy. Um, Jerson, thank you so much for making the effort to be here today. Alec, you've, of course, carried it all through in your usual style. You've involved every single one of us, and we are truly, truly grateful to all three of you for having made this effort and for having put in such a marvelous effort. I have to really thank Meenal Shirsagar. She's been, uh, well, ever since she saw the, we saw the performance at the museum, 
um, you remember for the folio, the inauguration of the folio, Meenal said we have to get them here for the Lit Club. And at a po one point we thought it wasn't going to happen, it's finally happened. And I'm so glad that so many of you were able to be here because you would have missed a marvelous evening if you hadn't made it. So once again, thank you, all of us, and to all three of you, our grateful thanks. Uh, with, our, with Mr. Kale, who is the president of the Asiatic Society, I'd request you to, uh, we uh, have stopped uh, believing in bouquets, flowers. Uh, we are a library, and we believe in books. And so here are uh, just one little memento to each of you uh, to remember this evening that you shared with us. <laughs>